devices. Um, I'll start uh, with the problem description and motivation for having such NICs. And then I'll uh, uh, continue with suggesting a software model to represent such NICs in the kernel. And finally, uh, show some uh, very early uh, proof of concept uh, performance numbers. Okay, so we'll start uh, with the problem description. So, uh, so far, um, probably all uh, high speed network interface cards that you know, they have just a single PCIe bus connectivity to the server. But uh, lately, uh, uh, network devices are starting starting to show up with uh, multiple PCI bus connectivities. Um, as you can see here, this is just a second. Uh, this is a Connectix 4 uh, NIC, and as you can see, it has an, an, a PCI extension here, which gives it another PCI bus connectivity, and the other one is you cannot see it here, but it's directly attached to the uh, main uh, NIC board. So you have two PCI buses to connect to the server for a single NIC device. So we'll start with the motivation. So we have uh, currently three use cases uh, where uh, such uh, network devices are beneficial. So the first case would be where the network port bandwidth is higher than the any that than, than the PCI bus connectivity uh, of any uh, PCI slot in the server. For example, uh, in this slide we see a server here which has two PCIe sockets. Each one is a Gen 3 by 16 which yields uh, 100 gigabits per second uh, speed. And we see a NIC with a network port of uh, 200 gigabits per second. Uh, so obviously if the NIC has just a single PCI bus connectivity like all NICs today, then the server cannot enjoy the, the high speed of the port. And as you can see on the right, if the NIC will have uh, two PCI interfaces, each one of 100 uh, gigabit per second, then the server can get the full, full wire speed of the NIC. And uh, this uh, use case, this example use case, is uh, going to be uh, very real in the in the near future, as network ports of 200 gigabits per second are going to be introduced very er very soon. And most servers today uh, do not have PCI sockets with that speed. So this is going to be a real use case in the uh, very near future. So that's one use case. Well, the other use case in the NUMA systems is a non-uniform memory access systems. In these servers, you have uh, multiple CPUs. Each one has its own cores. And each uh, CPU in the system has uh, its own local memory attached to it. Uh, but each CPU can access also memory uh, attached to other CPUs, which is a remote for the, the CPU. And uh, this connectivity is uh, server proprietary. The, co the, the interconnect that connects the multiple memory instances of the system. For example, the Intel QPI bus. Well, uh, in these systems also, each CPU has its own PCI socket. The PCI sockets are not shared between the CPUs. So if we have a NIC with just uh, one PCI bus, so we can, it can, we can connect it directly to just one CPU of the system, and then the NIC would be local only to one just CPU of the system. And this is a serious uh, uh, scalability issue, because only, n only network, network applications can run efficiently only on the CPU that is directly uh, connected to the NIC. Uh, for example, if a network apl application would run on a CPU that is remote to the NIC, then uh, it's the DMA access of the NIC for this application will have to go through remote DMA access, m accessing a remote memory from the NIC's perspe perspective. So obviously applications running on uh, such remote uh, CPUs 
will suffer uh, inferior uh, performance. And in addition to that, in addition to the lower performance they'll get, they also hurt uh, other applications that use the QPI bus. Because, for example, if a, a software if an application runs on CPU number one here and it wants to access, it needs to access memory uh, of S that is directly attached to CPU zero, then it has to go to the QPI bus. And if this QPI bus is overloaded with DMA accesses of the NIC, then there is a contention and uh, uh, this application will suffer worse performance to not only the network application. So this is a serious uh, scaling problem. And uh, with having a NIC with multi-PCI buses, you can see how this issue can be resolved. And the third use case I show here is what we call a multi-host NIC, which is a single uh, network port, a single network port uh, that serves uh, multiple servers, just different servers. They have a single NIC that serves many servers, and this way uh, you can save lots of money for uh, uh, network ports in the in the in the system. Okay, so these are the motivations, and now I'm going to talk about how to represent it in the software model. So, uh, the last use case of the multi-host is not relevant for the software model, since in this use case, each server just sees uh, a single PCI uh, bus and a single PCI and a single network device. So, the software model is not applicable to this use case. So, we're going to focus on the two other use cases. Okay, so um, we believe that the, be the, the rightmost way to represent such devices in the kernel is to keep sticking to the, net to the kernel convention of having a single net dev representing a single network port, as you can see here. And this means that uh, the you have on the PCI uh, subsystem level, you have two devices, and from the networking uh, stack perspective, you see just a single network port. And uh, in this model, uh, the all the aggregation of the aggregation of the PCI devices is done by the uh, device driver. Um, and as you can see, it also uh, symmetric symmetrically modeling the physical uh, layout of the device. You have two PCI interfaces and two PCI devices in the kernel, single network port and a single NetDev. And another benefit of uh, this uh, software model is that it works out of box. You don't have to configure anything in the kernel. And that's another advantage of this uh, model. Okay, so NetDev creation. What's problematic with uh, these uh, devices and the software model is that so far in the kernel, a NetDev that represents a physical uh, port device is being created upon its PCI probe. And uh, this, me this uh, method doesn't work for such devices because uh, you, you, wa you want a single NetDev and you have multiple uh, PCI devices, you'll have multiple probes. Uh, so, it doesn't work for uh, multi-PCI bus devices. Uh, so, you can have uh, uh, two different approaches to resolve this issue. Uh, one of them would be the static approach, is to create a NetDev uh, only when all the PCI buses of the device are probed. I mean, the first probe of the of the PCI, uh, th the first PCI bus of the device, you do not create the native yet, only when all the PCI buses of the net of the network device are uh, probed, only then you create the native. So that's one approach to achieve it. And uh, the other approach um, is the dynamic approach, would be to create a native upon the first, uh, the probe of the first PCI uh, uh, bus of the device. And then when uh, more PCI buses of the device are being probed, 
uh, dynamic, dynamically uh, enhance, adjust the net dev and create more resources for the for its uh, other PCI buses. And obviously the dynamic approach is mo more, more complicated to implement. But it may work. Okay, so uh, in order to achieve all that, you need some method to detect uh, that the device is a multi, multi uh, the device has uh, multiple PCI buses, and uh, with this uh, software pro this uh, this uh, software model, where the device driver is the one that implements all the PCI buses aggregation, it makes sense uh, to make this uh, detection method device specific and, and not make anything generic here. And so no no change in the PCI buses in the PCI subsystem nor in the, in the network stack, only in the device driver. Okay, so one may, may suggest to have, to resolve, uh, to represent such devices using a Linux bond or team device on top of two. I mean, create for each uh, PCI bus its own network device and then instantiate, enslave them into a Linux bond device. Uh, well, uh, I believe this uh, this software model is not as good as the previous one, mainly because it breaks the convention of, of having a one uh, net dev to represent uh, we to, uh, the the net the convention of having a single net dev per port, and uh, s as a consequence of uh, breaking this uh, convention, for example. Uh, you get uh, ambiguity in the port representation. For instance, uh, if you want to, s to, to show uh, the, the port speed, so how would you show it if you have two natives that represent the same port to which interface? It's, it's a kind of an unresolvable issue. In addition to that, uh, uh, there is no uh, straightforward to make the load balancing of uh, incoming traffic or fingers traffic over the multiple PCI buses. If you have a Linux bond, you have no way to no uh, straightforward way to control it. Uh, in addition to that, it it, it just uh, shows you see you have a single network port and you ha you see multiple nodes on the system, it's causing such a it's, it's cumbersome cumbersome view in the operating system and also it's not, it's not working out of box you need manual configuration to set up the the bonding device on top of the uh, net of the physical devices okay so w one of the problem with having multiple PCA buses is ordering it's uh, quite obvious for everyone here, that uh, each transmit queue and each receive queue of a of a network device must keep ordering within. You c if you have, uh, for example, a TX queue, uh, and you submit uh, two XMIT calls for this TX queue, you expect the two uh, packets of uh, these calls to be sent to the wire in order. This is obvious. On the other end, from the PCI specs pers perspective, there is no any ordering guarantee between two different PCI buses. So you cannot have the, the single TXQ transmit packets over two PCI buses. So conclusion of that is that uh, each TXQ, and the same goes for the RXQ, must be affined with a single PCI bus. Um, Okay, it's a, and, and usually uh, it's a common practice to have in the network devices that each TXQ and RXQ, uh, to have a TXQ and RXQ per core. They're usually affined per core. Uh, so in uh, the case of the NUMA system, uh, it makes sense to affine each TXQ to the PCI bus that is local to the core, which the queue is uh, affined with. So it's a quite intuitive and uh, in non-NUMA systems uh, the driver will have to just uh, 
uh, distribute the, the queues across the PCI buses in order to get uh, a decent uh, load balancing on the PCI buses. Okay, and uh, with uh, such devices com comes the question of to which PCI bus I have a single network device and I want to open a resource for it, so to which PCI bus will I uh, run the command to the NIC? I have multiple buses. Uh, so I think this should be a vendor-specific uh, decision. I mean, each driver can decide, each driver and device uh, can decide how to handle it. For example, I, I show you three options, there might be more. I mean, one option, implementation option would be to uh, assign one of the buses as the main bus for control operations to the NIC and assign and run all the commands to the NIC through this bus. Uh, option two here is to have the uh, resources that are, that are affined with a given PCI bus, for example, as we, sh as we saw that if the transmit queues and the receive queues that are affined with a the bus, then if the TXQ is assigned uh, with uh, that is affiliated with one bus, then we run uh, the, the creation command of this queue through the bus that it is affined with. And for resources that are uh, that are not affined with a PCI bus, use just one of the PCI buses. That may be another approach. And uh, another approach may be, I don't know, just uh, issue the commands through any of the PCI buses. Any command through any PCI bus. All that is a vendor uh, driver specific uh, policy. Whatever works for the device is good. Okay, now uh, what does it take to run uh, ARFS accelerated receive flow steering on such NICs? So the NIC will have to support, uh, I mean, a with ARFS we uh, insert uh, flow steering rules to the device that direct the traffic hitting this rule to a specific receive queue. So now we have receive queue on multiple PCI buses and obviously the device will have to support uh, flow steering rules that point to receive queues that are affined with different PCI buses. So this is a hard work that such a device will have to support. And uh, the strong thing about having uh, using ARFS in, uh, for example, in the in the NUMA system, would be that it 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 can be used to uh, completely eliminate the DMA traffic on the QPI in such system. Because if well I go back to the picture, as we can see here. With ARFS, each core will direct its traffic to the receive queues, to, to its own receive queues, and since the receive queues of this core are fined with this PCI bus, then traffic, each core will, re will receive its traffic with using ARFS, each core will receive its traffic directly from the PCI socket that is local to it, and then we'll have zero QPI traffic for DMA, for networking. This is a very strong feature. So this is about ARFS and RSS receive side scaling. So with RSS we have, uh, we used to have a single in-direction table in the device, but now we have multiple, we have receive queues that are refined with multiple PCI buses. So the NIC will have to support a single indirection table pointing to receive queues that reside on different PCI buses, as we can see here. Um, another benefit of such a model is that the, the RSS indirection table can be used not only to load balance the traffic among the different cores of the system, but also implicitly uh, control the load balance over the 
multiple PCI buses using using the same mechanism of the indirection table. And uh, obviously in NUMA system it also uh, controls the load balance over the memory system, the different instances of the memory system. So all done with a single mechanism that is uh, already known to everybody. Okay, what happens in virtualization? Um, in virtualization, we, 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 we would like to assign each VM, I mean, we want to give each VM access to the network port, but the network port has been accessed through two different PCI devices. So we will have to find a way to assign each VM with a virtual function of each PCI bus. And then inside the VM, the same driver that, the, the, that knows how to aggregate the PCI devices into a single network device, as we saw before, the same will happen inside the VMs with the same driver. Because it will see the two PCI devices, the two PCI devices, the driver will realize they represent a single network port, and then it, it will instantiate a single network device in the VM. And we'll have the same in the VM, the same view as we, ha we saw in the hypervisor. Um, but we have to figure out how to achieve that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not yet so familiar with the virtualization software management. Uh, I, I hope to get to it and see how to achieve it. But it's something we need to resolve. Okay, congestion. Um, uh, it would be a very common use case to have the network port speed. I mean, the s the each piece that it, it, it's, a, it's, a um, it's a common use case to have that uh, I each PCI bus, the speed of each PCI bus will be less than the network speed. It could be it could be a valid use case, especially for NUMA systems, to have PC multiple PCI buses, each one with the same speed or, uh, as the network board. It would make sense to make the system more scalable, but a, a, mo a common use case may be that the PCI bandwidth of each single PCI bus will be less than the bandwidth of the, of the network board. And in these cases, uh, uh, comes an issue with congestion because if we have, for example, here we have a network port of uh, 200 gigabit per second and two PCI buses, each one 100 gigabit per second. So it's half the speed. And if we have traffic, a burst of traffic that is destined to find with this PCI bus, so very quickly we'll have congestion coming from this PCI bus. Uh, and if we'll not do anything, then the congestion may hurt traffic going to other PCI buses. This is uh, a known situation in uh, switches. So in order to resolve this issue, the device has to deploy some method to avoid it. And uh, for example, the WRED, the weighted random early drop algorithm that is a known algorithm in switching would be that if one of the PCI buses starts to uh, fill up the receive buffer here, then we start dropping its, pa its packets, and this way con uh, the congestion does not affect, does not uh, propagate to other PCI buses. So this is something that has to be resolved in the device level, in the network device level. And finally, some uh, uh, performance number that we ran on a NUMA system. So uh, this this is the system we used. It was a Dell server running at uh, 3.2 gigahertz with 24 cores and uh, no hyper-threading. Hyper we used the Red Hat 7.3. We used a, conne a Mellanox Connectix 4 NIC. Uh, with uh, its port speed was uh, 100 gigabits, and it had two PCIe Gen 3 by 8 uh, PCIe sockets. Uh, 
And in the, this uh, test case, uh, we, we tested the, the bandwidth, the throughput of Ethernet traffic. And uh, in order to demonstrate the, the value of the multi-PCI bus, we also uh, uh, loaded the interconnect, uh, the QPI, with uh, software traffic. I mean, not a network traffic, just uh, a RAN application on the two sockets that access remote memory of each other. And then we ran the network uh, application. And as you can see here, uh, when we ran the application on the remote CPU of the NUMA system, we got a bandwidth of about uh, 80 gigabits per second. And when we ran it on the local CPU, this is the blue line, we got quite a line rate, which is almost 100 gigabit. And when we use the socket direct running using the uh, two PCI buses, we got close to the optimal uh, bandwidth. And probably the deviations here are due to the congestion problem that I just mentioned. Uh, bursts of traffic uh, reaching one of the PCI buses. Oh, so this is one test case we ran. And another in another test case, we ran uh, 150 TCP streams and measured the average latency of each, uh, of each such uh, TCP connection. And here you can see even more impressive results. Uh, so running on the remote uh, CPU of the system, you see very high latency for, the for each TCP stream. And running on the local CPU, obviously you see uh, much better uh, latency, much lower. And with the socket direct, which means running with uh, two PCI buses connected, you can see that we got even lower uh, latency. And this is probably better than the local uh, the test running only on the local CPU as it utilizes the caches of both CPUs. Uh, this is probably why the performance is even better than running on the local CPU. And that's it. So Jamal is not here to pass the microphone. <laughs> if anyone has questions. <laughs> you you want to ask? Or? Oh, OK. Well, uh, this is actually real good work, um, you know. Uh, thanks for leading the way because we have been thinking of exactly the same thing and same solution. Thank you. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I was looking at, you have like three options that you talked about when at probe time you could statically or dynamically, uh, you know, configure. I'm looking for your it. Yeah, that one. Where? Yeah, the, the dynamic and static approach. Where right is here, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, my suggestion would be to go with the dynamic one. Uh, the reason is you already have built into your uh, NetDev model where you can say set real number of queues, where you come up with maybe a large number of queues and there are only some that are active for the given PCI bus and then you go ahead and make the rest of the ones active as the other PCI buses come up. So you could dynamically add those. So I don't think it's complicated. I think it's actually pretty easy to get uh, you know, uh, make it work. The second thing, it'll scales really well for your SRV case. Because in SRV case, you're assuming that, you know, your administrator is ac actually uh, linking both your PCI interfaces into the VM, which uh, he or she may not do it, right? They might ac have only one PCI interface going right. in there. Right, so you cannot make that static approach assumption that both interfaces are there in your VM. Yeah, okay, generally I agree the dynamic approach is uh, more optimal, but about the complexity, I'm not sure it's simple uh, because uh, the issue you mentioned of scaling the NetDev dynamically is one issue. Another issue may be, for example, uh, if, you know, it's kind of vendor-specific, depends on the vendor-specific policy. For example, if you have uh, 
uh, in the creation, uh, in the management of the device, if you create some of the resources through one of the buses mm -hmm. and others through the uh, other bus. So think of the case when someone attaches uh, one PCI bus and then uh, attaches another one and detaches the first one. Mm -hmm. So you need you to, you could if, if you created resources through one of the PCI buses and the device does not know know them, uh, does not recognize them when access to the other PCI bus, then you have a problem. Yeah, although you could, I mean, the case where you said the first PCI bus goes down, you can always deactivate those queues, right? So you always have that option of not really keeping all those queues active. Yeah, but besides the queues, there are, o there are other resources, for example, the indirection table. So if it, it is res resides just on one of the PCI buses, then you have a problem. But I agree with you, it's the optimal solution, but less trivial to implement. Yeah. So I would like to um, perhaps uh, provide some, uh, well, I, I like the other solution better, the, the solution where you have net depth for every PF. Because for if you go this way, then you need an API basically to configure everything. Like it's a switch effectively. So if you model it as a switch, as you gave the example of red, right? You just assign like uh, put a red in TC on the net dev that's like underneath the bridge and that gives you red. And if you go and uh, pretend to the user that there's only one net dev, then you have to like teach everything, like tell the user which queue actually lives on which PCI. And like, you know, there's a lot of APIs that you will have to tell the, like for very basic users, one net dev is nice because they understand what it wor how it works. But if you go into power users who really want to optimize things, they will ask you like questions like how to actually like assign things properly. And then you need to add APIs for everything basically for yeah. every. Yeah, right. Uh, I totally agree. It's actually hiding. Actually, there is a switch on the device, right. but yeah. it's a switch not between physical network ports. It's a you have one network port and the other ports are actually PCI buses. Right, of the exactly. switch. So yes, uh, and sort of uh, you know, I, I assume that there, are s the, there will be people who will prefer not to uh, mess with a multi with a, a switch management for such devices. So for such people, uh, this is this solution would be better. And if uh, sophisticated, as you say, powerful uh, users will want real uh, a manageability of the internal switch and not hi instead of hiding it, then for them we'll have to have, have a s different software model, probably uh, some explicit switch, in expose an explicit switch to the system with uh, three net devs and the switch between them. But that doesn't fit, it may fit some sophisticated customers, but I believe many customers will prefer not to care about it and to have a, si or a simpler view in the system. But both, both uh, models uh, are, are valid, yeah. Thank you. I, I agree with you, both models are right, but I think that you may have run into a situation where the right answer on the host side when you've got a PF is that you want to expose everything, that you want to let them manage it, but in your example where you had up into the guest, in that situation you don't because you really need to be able to take um, off the shelf distros and run them and you don't want to have to be doing configuration in you know god awful you know let's say maybe it's rel 6 and you know already gone down that rat hole with azure and um you're going to run into that with every other but everybody else as well um so the right answer may be you want a single net dev when it shows up in the guest but you want to let you know the host do whatever configuration because that's that's not a you know off the shelf store situation. I completely agree with you. That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, any other questions? No. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, everyone.